we're just fishing. We can talk about the TV stuff and um, the Cathlon side of things if you want as well. That's yeah, good. well, mate, we just just fire away, and it's uh, yeah, I'm an open book right now. Cool. I'm, cool. A, okay. I'm a bored open book. <laughs> Isn't everyone? I know. I know. <laughs> See some of the jobs that people are posting up there doing around the home, mate. Isn't it surreal though? Do you know what I mean? Everyone yeah. says the same thing. You, I don't think anyone's really got their head around it. You know, no, I, it is like something out of a weird film. It is. I, think. I go through phases. I really do go through phases. Like when I'm doing something, it's just like a normal day. And then at two o'clock in the afternoon, after you've just had a bit of lunch and you're sitting down with the missus and you think, well, I might put a movie on. And you're like, I've just yeah. turned the movie off. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's <laughs> so surreal. I am, I mean, I've really, as much as, as much as I did the, the track and field and I've trained really hard, 50% yeah. of competing and training was resting. So I, yeah. I, I'm as far as most people are concerned. I'm really good at doing nothing, and I'm struggling <laughs> to do nothing. Yeah, it's it's just odd. I mean, it's I'm trying to be as disciplined as I can to have like treats, like you said, like films to look forward to. Yeah. So it doesn't become the norm. So that's why I'm obviously uploading these podcasts one a day, just to keep me sane as well, as much as everyone else. So you know, I've got stuff to. I'm trying to record as many as I can a day, so I've got a bit of a buffer as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my discipline, yeah, my discipline comes yeah. in in the in the in the form of trying not to eat an entire packet of digestives in one sitting, which not <laughs> which normally isn't a problem. I just smash them because I know I'm busy and I'm doing stuff and I'm burning calories. Yeah. But where I'm sort of, I mean, I'm an active guy and I'm training every day. I certainly ain't burning anywhere near as many calories as I normally do. So I make the coffee. The missus gets the biscuits out, and I think she only she only puts half a packet in every day. <laughs> <laughs> about half past three, about half past three, four o'clock, we have a coffee and we sit down and we watch a bit of telly. <laughs> and it's sad. I feel like I'm 80 years old already. <laughs> and, and we just eat biscuits and watch telly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll so, tell you what, there's going to be a lot of very um, grateful people out there that have that sort of overlooked the very basics that we almost take for granted. Yeah. Uh, uh, pre lockdown. Of course, absolutely. And you know what? I'm looking around the house as well, and I'm thinking, why do I need half the stuff that I've got? No. I, re- I really don't. You know, you really don't, do you? I'm going to have a good clear out of this office I'm sitting in right now. And when I'm confident that it's not going to rain or the wind isn't like minus 20, because I don't know about you, but yeah. we've got an horrible – it's a lovely day outside, but we've got an horrible cold wind, and I don't really want to be out in that all day if I can help it. But I've got to clear the office out and I've got to clear the garage out. And really, other than that, I'm finding stuff to do. Like, I ain't got yeah. a lot to do. <laughs> <laughs> There's only so, so many rigs and everything else you can tie as well, isn't there? I, I tied 30 rigs on the first day of lockdown. I thought, right, I'm going to fill all my five rig boxes up. And then I looked at the 30 rigs and I was like, well, that's going to do me a season. <laughs> right? And I've just spoke to a mate of mine. He said, oh, I've just decorated the bathroom. I'm doing the hall. And, I'm, and I'm, I don't need to do any decorating. Like... Do you know what I mean? It was done last year. So I'm, I've really <laughs> shot myself in the foot by being just uber efficient in the past 18 months. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Right, let's um, let's go for it. So welcome to the podcast. Today's guest, we've got Dean Macy. Dean, welcome. Thank you, my friend. How are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Like I say, we've um, just spoke a bit off mic about very strange times. Before we sort of go into how we're, we're dealing with them, um, for those that don't know you, can you give us a bit of an intro and background? Well, in a nutshell, I was a professional athlete and then and now I've, I'm an angler. <laughs> it's really weird, isn't it? I was from, oh, I can't remember what the years are, from 99 till 2008. I was a professional mm. decathlete, went to a few world championships, won medals in all the worlds, come fourth in two Olympics, won a 2006 Commonwealth Games decathlon title. Um, that was my last real major championship, to be fair. Um, right. But since 2005, I think it was, I've been employed i guess you could say um i am a freelance slash consultant um so i'm not really employed by anyone like paye other than myself um yeah. but yeah I've, I've been doing fishing shows from on course to fishing gurus to now fishing all stars and then obviously the big fish off as well so um mm-hmm. yeah my life has taken a really weird and random <laughs> sort of turn and you know what i never really I, I, I never planned for any of it i've just rolled with the punches and i've loved every yeah. minute Brilliant, brilliant. How did it come about, that transition from athlete to angling TV star? Well, look, we're star. <laughs> I know we're all bored, but let's not go that far. But, well, I mean, first things first, I picked up a fishing rod many, many years before I ever put a pair of spikes on. 
So I was fishing from probably the age of 10, 11, something like that. Maybe a little bit earlier, but, you know, all I, I was six foot, whatever happened. Um, <laughs> and then, um, and then, and then obviously I gave up fishing a couple of years whilst I was trying to become a professional athlete, just through funds and time and things like that. Um, and then picked it back up again, I don't know, around 90, I'm going to say 97, 98. Um, but yeah, after the 2004 Olympics, which was my second Olympics, I came fourth in both of them. So I came fourth in Sydney and I came fourth in Athens. Um, and quite simply, I did an interview on TV and some one of, I can't remember who it was, but one of the interviewers asked me what I was going to do because I, I must be really depressed after coming fourth a second time on the bounce. And, and do you know what? Fourth place in Sydney was a bit of a bit of pill to swallow, if I'm honest. But fourth place mm-hmm. in Athens, I honestly went into that thinking if I come in the top 10, in the Olympics, I'd have done well because I, I had a, quite a large, substantial tear in my left hamstring and I reopened it several times leading into the comp. So I didn't really know what sort of shape I was in or even if I was going to finish. So to come yeah. forth again and beat people that I'd been training with leading up to it who were, they basically had my number before that competition. I, I, if you'd have told me where I'd have come, I really wouldn't have known. But I, I was pretty confident that they were going to give me a whooping because they were just in better shape than me. And so to come out fourth there... And mm-hmm. and beat the training partners that I was I was losing to going into it was a right result. But my response to to, to that interviewer was basically, look, yeah, fourth is fourth. It is what it is. It's better than fifth, but it's the first loser, really, isn't it? But um, I had a trip to I can't remember where it was. It might have been Fisherville, but I had a trip to France, um, all mm-hmm. booked up, and I think I left like five days after the Olympics. And I said, but can't be bad because I've got a week in, uh, a week in France fishing, and um, and literally within the space of 10 hours, my agent was on the phone, said Discovery have just rung up and said they can sort out a little TV show for me if I was up for filming it. And in 2005, I uh, I recorded On Course. And, and On Course really was the platform for my all-round angling, to be fair. So I came into yeah. sort of like the all-round specimen side of things quite late in my life. Um, and not too long ago, to be fair, in comparison to quite a few people. Um, but where... I, where leading up to that, I was purely match or carp orientated. Um, I sort of had to branch out because we went bream fishing with Phil Smith. We went chub fishing with Steph Horak. We went barbel fishing with Ray Walton. We went grayling fishing with Pete Redding. Did obviously carp fishing with Terry Earn, who else back then was there to go for, uh, go with. But um, I, I didn't mean that in a bad way. Like he was the only one, like he's God of carp yeah. fishing, isn't he? Do you know what I mean? But, yeah, um, yeah. but and, and really at the end of that, I don't know how long it took us to – we only had a couple of days per shoot. I know that, but I'm not sure how long the shoot was over from start to finish. But at the end of it, I thought, what am I doing wasting my time just fishing off of a box or just fishing for car? I need to get my head in the game. And, and really it opened my eyes to the fact that fishing is sort of like a rainbow. Like there's so many colours in that rainbow, and I want to experience all of them. Um, mm-hmm. And to be fair, once I'd caught my first double-figure barbel and saw a couple of big chub on the bank, I'm – you know, I was hooked as an all-rounder, to be fair. Yeah, that's right. one thing I'd love to go for, Barb. I've not done it yet. Uh, do you know what? On social media, I would say the most popular question I get asked is, how do I catch my first barbel? Right. It's a very difficult well, question. Give, give it to answer. It's probably well rehearsed. Go to the river, why? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> genuinely, we've done so many shows, whether it be like Dino's Diaries or just um, product development pieces for Guru where we've launched certain feeders and hook links and hooks and stuff. We've done mm-hmm. so much footage and content over on the river, why, that you literally have to log on to YouTube or go on to the, the Guru website, look at any of the number of videos that we've done over on the River Wire. Myself, I've taken Rooney over there and um, Ringer. Ali's been over there a load of times as well with us. And and then just go and do it. It really is it's a case of finding the fish, but obviously knowing the venue. And if you want to go somewhere just to experience the the joy, that the, like the pers- personification of catching a barbel, then of course you can go to small rivers all over the country and catch or try to catch 14s, 15s, and 16s. Or you can go to possibly the most beautiful part of the country, which is, you know, England and Welsh border, um, sort of through Herefordshire, through Ross and Wye, through Simmons Yat, and you can fish possibly the most stunning river on the planet, um, the River Wye, for, you know, some of the best-looking barbel there are. And if you go on certain stretches, you will pay a premium. Of course, you'll pay 20 quid, 25 quid a day per person, but there'll only be one or two of you on a mile and a half of river. So the water, the watercraft that you'll learn in that 
one or two days that you're there is going to be worth months on a on a on a really busy day ticket stretch. Yeah, I can imagine. You know, what is it that sort of swayed you more towards the barbel than sort of other species? Well, no, I don't have a, I don't have a, I don't have a particular favourite fish. If I had, if I have to pick, then chub has always been my favourite species. Um, mm-hmm. They were always. The reason being is because when I was a kid, my dad in the six weeks holidays used to drop me off at the River Blackwater, and then he used to disappear off to work, and then come pick me up six o'clock in the afternoon. Back then, I mean, what was that? That was. 25 30 years ago back then it was safe to just leave your kids in a park you know they were mm-hmm. going to be there in the end of the day but you can't do that nowadays unfortunately but and i used to watch all these chub they're only small they're only sort of two three four pound maximum um swimming up and down this river and i used to literally i was skylining them i was throwing lumps of bread at them i was so crude it was unbelievable but they were smarter than i was good um and because i really struggled to catch them yet i could see them so clearly um, they instantly instantly became a bit of an obsession to me, um, mm. and now down the line, obviously I've refined my skills and I've you know my my, my favourite and biggest and, and best achievement is, is a is a big chub, um, and I've caught obviously lots of various different big species, um, but I would say the eight one chub that I caught probably three years ago now was the best I'll ever catch, unless I catch an eight two or an eight three. But but to be yeah. fair though, mate, I love. You know, I love the six-week window when you can target the tench and they're really accessible. And and you know, the double, the first double-figure tench I ever saw blew my mind. Um, mm. Obviously, I love barbel because, I mean, most people that fish rivers, if you had to pick between a barbel and a chub, barbel trumps the chub in almost every single way for some reason or another. They fight harder, they look better, they grow bigger. But the the reason I love the chub is because you can just catch them in any 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 river conditions. Pretty much they'll have a go if you can find them. Yeah. Any weather they'll have a go. They're hardy as you like. They'll eat pretty much anything as well. Yet they when they get big they can be so so cagey. So they present a really good challenge as well. Um, mm-hmm. But mate, I'll, I'll fish for anything. And at the time while I'm fishing for roach, rud, pike, perch, you, you name it, then that that there and then will be my favourite species. Yeah, and absolutely. And I say, being so interested in a bit of everything, I'd imagine you're constantly busy sort of every month of the year. I am. And it's an absolute nightmare because my garage is a right old mess. <laughs> I do think to myself often, I think, right, if I only ever fish for carp, it would be so much easier, you know. I'd have <laughs> room in the garage to do so many more things. But I do love it, though. Do you know what I mean? Like this winter just gone has probably been the most prolific carp winter I've ever had. Simply yeah. because certainly where I've been fishing on day tickets around, like sort of in Essex, um, I haven't really ventured far afield. I've had a couple of syndicate uh, waters that I've visited, a couple of day ticket waters that I've visited, and a couple of club waters that I've had a go at. But with the mild conditions, I haven't really done much travel barbel or pike fishing this winter because the carp rods have stayed out because they've just kept fishing. You know? Yeah, so we didn't really have a winter, did we? There wasn't really any frost? Or... Well, I turned up to the lake twice um, when we had a frost. But the days we had, well, the mornings we had frosts, we also had sort of 12, 14, 15 degrees during the day. And if you could get off the back of the wind and find somewhere shallow, then fish were sat in the upper layers or right in the edge. And I mean, I remember one trip this winter, I had nine bites in four hours, I think it was. Um, had the, had the, the biggest one in the lake as well, 37 and a half, in winter yeah. colours, middle of January. And when I turned up, it was like minus two, crunching under your feet. But it was mm. come the end of the day. I say end of the day. I mean, I packed up at one o'clock or something like that. Um, <laughs> I had T-shirt and shorts on almost. Wow. How so, did you go about targeting then? Oh, simple, mate. I, I haven't done any classic sort of carp winter tactics so i haven't gone on the worm i haven't gone on the maggot i've done everything every as i normally do i've been fishing over 10 mil cell with a little wafter and that's it and i've just been pinging in baits every sort of 20 30 minutes they've been so active they've still been hunting on the venues that i've been fishing that is i know other venues around the country have really responded to the maggot uh, and, and brilliant but the the venues that i've been fishing where there's been a decent amount of footfall and there's been quite a few anglers and the 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 angling pressure has been pushing the fish around and they've still been eating quite a bit. I've literally fished over 10 mil boily, mate. It's not, it's not been difficult at all. And by that, I mean, I haven't had to refine anything, you know, it's just been really simple fishing. Nice. Is it just uh, day ticket waters that you tend to target Dean or, or are you a member of syndicates as well? Or? No, I've got a few tickets and stuff, you know, um, I'm, I, I, my plan is to spend a little bit more. I, I, I probably do 
five or six weeks abroad every single year. Um, so mm-hmm. I spend a fair bit of time abroad for my for my own fishing. This is this is aside from all of the filming that I do as well. Yeah. Um, so I spend about five or six weeks abroad every single year. Um, it normally starts every every January. I've got two weeks booked in, and then it just goes up and up and up. Do you know what I mean? Where I get offered a trip here or there, and I just take them all if I'm not working. Um, <laughs> but in the near future, I've actually purposely stopped booking any trips um, simply because I want to spend a bit more time in the UK. So I've got I've got a couple of tickets, um, and my plan is to target some some bigger fish in the UK a little bit closer to home. Um, yeah. Just simply because I'm the way work's going and the way life is turning out, it's harder to find those weak slots. And, and mm-hmm. you know, let's face it, I mean, carp are getting bigger all over the world, but they're getting bigger in the UK as well. Um, and so if I can if I can target 40-pound fish and 50-pound fish, which is the sort of size of fish and upwards, obviously, in the continent. But if you come up, I, I always think if you come home from France or Croatia or Hungary or wherever you've gone, you've caught a 50 then you can't moan. There might be 60s, 70s, 80s, or even 90s in front of you, but a 50-pound is still a proper fish wherever you are in the world. Well, if you've got access to targets fish of that size that's an hour and a half, two hours from your doorstep, then, yeah, I think it's it's time to start maximising those opportunities as well. Yeah, and so is that sort of campaign-type style of carp fishing going to be something a bit new to you? No, no, no. Carp fishing, to be fair, is still still quite a major part of my my angling to be fair and it's it plays a major part in how i target a lot of other species as well um i mean take the chub for instance you know some of the big chub that i've caught i've utilized more sort of bolt rig carp style tactics over the years whereas you know generally before that i was trying to catch them on more traditional sort of you know tip rods cheese paste and 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 even on the float and maggot and i've caught some excessively big chub on float and maggot as well but but on some of these hard pressured waters where there's you're only fishing for one bite or even one fish in a swim, you know you're onto a hiding to nothing if you if you don't adopt a slightly more sort of carp approach. Um, and so it, it has played quite a large part in how I've targeted various other big fish as well. Um, but it, it's always been a big part of my fishing. Like I said before, I adopted the sort of all rounder mentality, going for what's feeding at whatever particular time of year we're in then I was either on my box or I was sat behind a set of rods. So I wouldn't class myself as anything. I just go fishing and I try to adapt and I try to have as many strings to my bow as possible. And I think they all overlap at certain points as well. Agreed. Yeah, definitely. And so with what would a typical day look like for you obviously not during this lockdown and biscuits <laughs> what do you mean do I take my, lockdown day do i take my pajamas off yeah i take my morning pajamas <laughs> off put my evening ones on then i put my night ones on after that um it may it very much depends because i mean I, I i'm not a full-time angler and and i never i never profess to be I, I never want to be either fishing is a big part of my life but i certainly don't want it to be all of my life i'm not I don't think I could ever, even if I was offered the chance, I don't think I could ever be a nine to five Monday to Friday angler. It, mm-hmm. it, I, it would it would kill my love for the for the sport. And actually, mm-hmm. you know, as much as I am gagging to get out on the bank right now, and it is the probably my favourite part of the year. And and mm-hmm. I can also see this lockdown going straight into sort of tension season as well. Like I said, that's only normally six weeks long for me. Um, right. I do think that this is going to be helping an awful lot of people with regards to like I've been fishing for probably 30 years right and I go fishing to certain venues and I get excited and I go fishing to certain venues and I know I'm going to catch and it's all good and I enjoy it all mm-hmm. but along the way no matter who you are you can't replicate when you've been fishing for 30 years and you're quite experienced you know what you're going for and you know how you're going to target them and, and most of the places you know what you're, you're fishing for too You can't replicate that time when someone picks you up at two o'clock in the morning, takes you over to Gloucester Park, says we're going to fish Tench Point and we're going to fish the lift method. And you've got you've got a deck chair and a torch in your hand and you don't know what you're doing. But your heart's pumping out your chest and you're just so excited. You mess everything up. Right. Like that's what we're all going to be like when we get back out in the bank. Do you know what I mean? It's going to be like the first cast ever again. Like where I left off. 
drilling it into a teacup underneath a big load of bushes. I'm going to be going around in a boat taking my rigs out of the trees. <laughs> <laughs> no, so true. That repetition so important. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. And so, but a typical day for me is so is so difficult to explain because if I'm not like fifth, I would say I'm really busy for seven or eight, maybe nine months of the year like really right. busy because I do the filming, I work in the fishing industry as a consultant, I do various different bits and bobs in that industry, but also I still work quite heavily and I have a lot of areas and genres that I work with within the track and field industry. So I, I work with a few companies doing um, academies through the holidays, um, I do master classes, I travel all over the world teaching people how to teach athletics and how to coach athletics. Um, so I have a very eclectic way of living. Um, and sometimes it's a right pain in the ass. I've got to say, mate, because coming off of the back of like four weeks coaching, running, jumping, throwing, and being that Olympic sort of guy, um, mm-hmm. and then going sitting in a bush trying to catch a chub and being all quiet and stuff is they're, they're two complete ends of the spectrum. But <laughs> but but I don't honestly think I'd change it because the two things that I've there's not many things in this world I've ever been good at, but track and field, you can't argue, and fishing. Look, if I haven't if I haven't delivered over the last ten odd years, then I certainly wouldn't still be here. Um, so those two things are probably the two things that I I'm best at, and and I make a living from them. And so I am one lucky guy. Do you know what I mean? And and like I said, I never really I never really pursued them. They I sort of fell into my lap, and and I've just grabbed hold of them by both hands. Yeah. So did it all sort of stem from that, like you say, that one comment that you made and obviously your agent then picked up on it. Did the, I assume the consultancy work then sort of followed after that first TV show? How yeah. did that come about? Yeah, no, it did actually. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. So I wasn't sponsored or I, I, I didn't have any interest in being sponsored. I just went mm-hmm. fishing because I loved it, mate. And so obviously, yeah, I got a bit of sponsorship through um, leading into and through the on course. Um, and then that continued into launching a like a small brand um with my name sort of signature in it um mm-hmm. and then um yeah and then well i don't know how long, how long have i been with guru now 10 years right something like that i remember i signed with jrc um and i was about eight months into my contract and then um out the blue ali rung me um and and i'd said oh mate i'm so sorry i said it's a great opportunity but i've literally just signed with jrc and he went, oh, okay, fair enough. And then the next day he went, rang me and he went, sod JRC. <laughs> he, went, he went, we want you. And I was like, oh, no, that's not, that's not the way I work, mate. I'm so sorry. Um, but in the end, we, we met up a couple of times and, and, and what Guru were offering through the Sky TV show Fishing Gurus at the time, um, just the opportunity side of things, um, I ended up making the jump. And, and to be fair, everything that they promised has come true. And Korda and Guru in the last 10 years have gone from strength to strength to strength. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a hell of a company and well run, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely, mate. Yeah, it couldn't be under um, under better management. And I certainly wouldn't be prouder to be associated with anyone else quite as much as I am them. Yeah. So I suppose for you, when, when you're on the bank... How is how is it for you when you're on the bank and you're fishing these busier waters? Is um, it quite full on from obviously being recognised and? No, it's fine. No, to be, yeah. I, mate, I love the social side of fishing. You know, all right, I go fishing and I want my own time. But if I want my own time and I go fishing, then I'll sit in my bivvy. And generally, if you sit in your bivvy, you know, or under your brolly, then it's a decent indication to most people that you really just want to be on your own, and that's that's what you're there for. And and, and I yeah. think anglers are all similar in that respect. And I think that you don't have to be ignorant to, to let people know that you just want to be on your own. You know, obviously I'll, this is the other thing about fishing rivers. Generally, most people can't even find me. Like I'm six foot five. Yeah. I'm bald as a coot. The sun shines off my head like a beacon, but I know <laughs> spots that you won't find me in. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's cool. <laughs> uh, but I genuinely... Your little haven. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, plus I've got that fake nose and moustache that I wear, which is fantastic. <laughs> Um, but no, mate, I, I genuinely love the social side of fishing. So I, don't, I haven't got an issue with any of that. Um, the filming side of things is difficult simply because where you're restricted to catching fish in front of the cameras and the cameras are generally only there in office hours, then you can turn up at 4 a.m. and you can feed the biggest, bestest fish in the in the edge and, and have them sitting there with their gobs open. But at 9 o'clock, mate, they ain't there. And if they are, they ain't hungry. So it's so frustrating filming because I've said so many times, fishing and filming 
are two completely different things. I remember going to yeah. a venue to have a bit of a practice that was only local to me. It was a fishing guru shoot. So it was a one-day shoot. And, and I, I'm certain I had something like 29 carp in the day. And <laughs> I, about three days later, I went back, and we managed to fish the same swim in the same conditions. I was getting loads of liners. I knew them fish were there, and I think for the shoot, I had about seven. Now, that ain't because I fished poorly, and it ain't because the fish weren't having it. It's because it takes so long to do stuff. You know, by the time you've got a fish in the net, you think, right, I just want to unhook it, stick it on the mat, quick, cheesy grin, and then slip it back. Mate, you can do that. That's not a problem. But the cameras take so long to organise, and it's sort of, you know, getting the back shot and getting the lighting right. And then once the fish has gone back, you're still probably, I don't know, quarter of an hour before you got the, right, the, the rig back in position. Yeah. You know, so it is something that does take a lot of getting used to. And and I think that certainly where we film on a lot of public venues and there's a lot of public around on a lot of the shoots when we actually film in, the people that are there to observe how we do it and how it needs to be done to make a show very quickly appreciate how different and how difficult it, the actual film inside is. Um, and like yeah. I said, it does take a bit of getting used to. But once you can sort of quietly walk around the back of a large tree and just scream really quietly into your hands and come back all unflustered and get the rigs back out, it's fine. But, um, yeah, we've had – bottom line is, mate, if you don't catch it on camera, it don't count. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's why a lot of the times you bivvy up on the bank just to save the swims and you'll, 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 you'll film Monday, Tuesday, right, but you'll stay there Monday night just so no one jumps in and mm. they're boshing all over the shop. And you just don't fish because it's just no point. Because if you catch it, if you catch the biggest fish in the lake during the night, you're probably not going to catch it the very next day. And you'd rather catch it the next day for the shoot. So it's a really, it's, it's it's a big juggling act. I saw Pecky mention on um, on the quarter podcast actually that he said it's like fishing with the handbrake on. He described it. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I think hundred um, percent. Yeah, everything you want to do. You can do it, but you just have to do it in slow-mo. And by the time you've seen something and reacted to it, generally, not all the time, but a lot of the time, certainly in the 50 or 60% of the time, them opportunities are gone. You know, And as we know, there's a, fine, there's a really fine line between success and failure sometimes. I mean, some days you can fuzz it up a tree and it's amazing. You know, it just goes off with whatever. Um, but other times you have to really work hard for bites. And on them days, it, it, it's difficult. Yeah, it really is difficult and frustrating because you get a small window of opportunity and you have to react on a sixpence. And even though you can react, you can pack up and move straight away, you know, it's very difficult to do that and then come back and then just fill in the slots, the bits that we missed, um, because inevitably you'll just miss certain cutaways and it just won't work. Yeah, and I suppose you've got all the continuation side of it as well. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So we just we just film it as it is. Um, I mean, there's the, the great thing about nowadays is you haven't got to worry about like faking bites or anything like that because you just got cameras sat there watching the rods and the uh, and the bobbins all day long. You know, so you just set one camera up right on your pod or your buzz bars, and that just sits there all day. Bite cam, job done. Um, mm-hmm. So the cameramen have pretty much just got their 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 sort of cameras on on tripods on a wide, waiting for you to run in to lift the rod up. If you do, if you are lucky enough to get a bite, and then then it all kicks off from then. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's it's I I do love it though. It took a while. I know it's a lie. No, I, I don't know why I even said that. I loved it from the start. But I've yeah. but it, but it's always been a it's always been a juggling act. It's always been a real compromise from the start. And I don't think you'll I don't think you'll. I don't think you'll speak to anyone that does a fair bit of TV work that says any different. There is a massive compromise between fishing and filming. The only the only time I will say that it's just a case of go and film is we do these sort of Dino's diaries, which are um, uh, basically I just get a, a one cameraman sent over from Guru. If we're lucky and we've got staff, we get two. Um, mm-hmm. And it is just me going fishing. And so generally you'll find me in the swim. I was all, I already would have found my spots. I would already have put me a bit of bait in. Um, and it's just me fishing and talking you through what I'm doing on this particular session, what we're targeting. Um, and if you look at the size of the fish on the few that we've done, um, you know, we've had multiple nine pound tench. We've had multiple six pound chub. We've had multiple double figure bream. We've mm-hmm. had barbel of just under 15 pound. And on the shoots mm-hmm. where you're allowed to fish, you catch big fish on the shoots where you have to film. You tend to struggle a little bit more. Uh, have you got uh, 
any interesting or funny, quirky stories that you can share from filming or, or just um, in general? I've got, I've got one little story from the riverbank that you might be interested in. And this, you remember I said a little bit, a little while ago, um, with regards to it's a fine line between success and failure, right? Mm-hmm. Well, on Fishing All Stars season two, we went to Croatia, and on our very last challenge, we was on a river called the River Mejnica. Um, I don't know how far it runs. It runs 300 miles through the middle of Croatia or whatever, but it's, it's a fair old slap of water. Um, right. Anyway, on the very first night, got all the rods out. Rooney, who was bivvied up next to me, had a take. The take was so brutal that he could barely get the rod off the rest because we was all there on the spot. He'd literally, you know, it was, I don't know, half past nine at night or something. Anyway, he did everything right, got the rod up, Started walking backwards. He was fishing to the far bank. Yeah, there were snags around, but it actually done him in a snag that was halfway back from the far bank to where he was standing. So we didn't actually know that that snag was there. And it cut him off. Um, but the next 36 hours, mate, we had maybe four or five chub up to about four pound, but we was carp fishing. We was after some of these these very elusive, wild um, river carp in Croatia. So, you know, catching a four-pound chub if you're on a tip rod is banging for a TV show, but not when you're on three-and-a-half-pound rods and, and like 50-pound braid and size twos, do you know what I mean? So it ain't the one. Anyway, so we only had 48 hours on this place, and we had no information whatsoever. We just had a farmer turn up, and he said, there you go, there's the weir pool. This is your stretch. He said, many carps, good luck. That's all he said, right? Many carps <laughs> my backside. Maybe certain times of the year, but not while we was there. Um <laughs> Anyway, so one night in, Rooney's had a take, got cut off, unfortunately. 36 hours later, we'd had three or four chub through the night, dropping the rigs again and everything like that. And it was really looking poor. And um, it was that late in the day. Remember I said we just have a bike cam. When the rods are out, we just stick a camera on the on the buzzers, on the, on the, on the rods, so you never have to miss a bike. Well, it was that late in the day that my cameraman had taken bike cam away from my rods, right? He was packing bike cam away. And I had a rod go off. Anyway, I don't know if you've seen the show. Great. If not, I'll, I'll describe the, the, the sort of the situation. So it turned out to be quite possibly the greatest carp fight of my life. Um, flat rodded me from 100 yards on the far bank. And we were on proper stout, proper gear as well. Do you know what I mean? Um, got it to the inside by hook or by crook. And this river was up and down like a yo-yo. You'd have nine foot of water and then 10 foot away, it'd be 29 foot of water. So it was like a proper moonscape. You know, when people say upside down egg boxes, this is exactly what it was. Um, Mm -hmm. Then it started kiting downstream to my left. So Rooney runs down, throws in a load of rocks. And instead of scaring it out, which was the plan, it didn't. It just scared it further downstream at a slightly further, faster rate of knots. Anyway, so I've jumped in. Then I've had to jump back out again get into this dirty, great, big, long, yellow, 12-foot banana boat thing that we was given to, to drop the rigs, which actually looked a bit stupid but was ever so good for dropping rigs because it was so manoeuvrable, it was sweet. Um, then I've done some loop-de-loops and followed it downstream. It's done me in a snag. I've hand-lined it out of snag. And in this in this time, Gary Newman, who's part of the crew at the time, has run upstream, got into another boat, rowed down to me so he can help me stabilise this dirty, great canoe thing. Rooney at this time, because I'm on the near bank, has grabbed hold of the other end of the kayak that I'm in, this banana boat, and he's holding me between him and a tree. And I'm at this, I don't know how long it was. It was 29 minutes from bite to, uh, well, from the cameras rolling to actually landing the fish. Anyway, I've had this, I've hand lined it out of the snag that it got us in. Then I've got it back on the rod and I'm just playing this fish, giving it the butt for, I don't know, probably another three or four or five minutes. I've landed the fish, right? Slid it in. Done the bits of the camera, lovely. Camera's cut. Everyone's jumped around. The director's got tears in his eyes, everything. Because it was up until then, it was such a good shoot, but we we felt like it needed something sort of special to finish it off. And we was probably five or six minutes of, of content short of a full show as well. And so for that to go off and for the fight to be so spectacular and fill in the remainder of the content that we needed was ever so fortunate. But the most fortunate part of that, it was as I've looked into the net, I've looked down at the fish, and Rooney said to me, he says, what is it? I said, it's a dirty, great big com. Turned out to be 36-pound odd common, which was epic, you know, a wild river Croatian common, fantastic. The carp just didn't get any better. But guess what I saw hanging out of his mouth? <laughs> Rooney's rig. Rooney's rig from the first night. <laughs> How's that? Now, the dividing line oh. between success and failure. He did nothing wrong, you know? Yeah. He just done him in a snag, and, and, and it's just that. Just it was just unfortunate. And it run me past that same snag at some point in the fight. 
that I had yeah. like, two days later. But I just didn't yeah. land in it. And I, I remember saying to him, I said, Room, did you have a size four wide gay pecs on? He went, yeah, why? I said, 30 pound in trap. He went, yeah, why? I said, leg clip. He went, yeah, why? I said, do you have a safe zone leader as well? He went, yeah, why? I said, it's in the bottom of the net. And he went, nah. I went, not only is it in the bottom of the net, dude. I went, it's in the bottom of the lip of the carp. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Some, wow. some weird and wonderful things happen when you're on shoots. And, and them fish that just, um, I mean, when you lose a fish for the show, it's really weird. Because in the back of my mind, I'm going, oh, you need that. You need a fish. Do you know what I mean? Because it, it's just a show. It's like, it's, if, if you catch a fish, it's a fishing show. But if it's not, it's just a show. Um, but if you lose a fish for the show, in the back of your mind, you're going, oh, like, damn. You, you, you're gutted, obviously. But the editor side of things and the director in the back of your head is going, ooh, mm, jeopardy. Mm. Good show this may make, <laughs> but you still need to catch one to actually, you know, do you know what I mean, to finish the show off. Yeah, if you if you lose a fish for yourself, then the rod goes all over the place and you're devastated. I don't ever have that devastation if I lose a fish on camera because I think, well, that's content. It's fishing. It's yeah. life, you know. Um, and on the same series, I lost a big cat um, in Spain just to finish the show off, and I, I, I really didn't care. My whole point for that shoot was that Rooney caught his first ever 100-pounder. He did that on his first fish. Um, and the fact that I actually blanked on that part of the shoot and didn't catch a cat did not bother me one bit. I just thought, great, shows the highs and lows of the fishing. Um, yeah. So, it's, it's you know, in that respect, it's um, the filming side of things does some funny things to your head because the angler always wants everything to go right, but the director side of things in your things, we just, we, you know, I'd, I'd really want a little bit of a fork in the road because that would be a great shoot. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And like you say, I'd imagine losing a, a huge, or potentially a huge cat from somewhere in Spain as well, that really builds that element of suspense, doesn't it? Well, the thing is, I was last on the rod, so we'd already got the result in the bank. So we had three of us on that shoot. We had Rooney who'd caught a 110, Gary caught a 120, then I was third on the rods and, and, and my one fell off. Hey-ho, you know, it, it, it really didn't bother me because we'd already succeeded in the challenge as a team. Of course, it would have been nice to finish off holding a dirty, great, you know, slug in the Ebro uh, to finish it off. But, but again, it shows the highs and lows of the sport. Yeah. What, what percentage of your... Um of your year is taken up just from the filming and the TV side of things? Um, not much. I mean, this year I had five weeks penciled in for filming. Um, mm. Then you got the post shoots. So like once the shoot's been filmed, then it, you know, we all get given the rough edits to look through, to make notes. And then we get given the voiceover, which inevitably has to be rewritten once or twice because the director does a fantastic job with writing the voiceover and the content, but it's generally not in a fishy sort of terminology. Um, mm -hmm. So like, you know, post filming takes up a fair bit of time as well, but you know, there, there are guys on there that do much more than I do. Um, it's yeah, I would say it, it very much depends because I mean, at the moment, we haven't got Big Fish off running. But when we had Big Fish off, then we had – how many how many episodes were in that one? Four or five? Right. I think it was five. Yeah, it must have been five. So we had five weeks for the fish off. Then we had all-stars slash gurus at the time. So, you know, a couple of years ago, it was an awful lot more than what we've got now. But the but the time that we get to, to film the shows, because it's on ITV4 and they're 46-minute shows now, it takes a little bit longer. So generally, each shoot is each shoot is five days long, so a Monday to Friday shoot, which sounds a lot when you're doing a 46-minute show. But when you've got three quite large elements to that show, and let's face it, big fish sells. You know, like if we caught a four-pound cruisian, you know, as anglers, we know a four-pound cruisian is worth a 50-pound carp, but it's still a four-pound fish. You know, which one which one looks bigger and better on telly? It's a no-brainer. Um, so, you know, we really have to, but for the all-star shoots, I think we're up against it because we have to try to make, and I feel, I feel a little bit aggrieved sometimes when you have to try to make a two-pound roach or a three-pound perch seem better than it is because they're epic fish in their own right. Um, yeah. But Joe Public and the vast majority of angling now are obsessed with carp, and so it's... Um, Catching the specimens of other species because they're not quite as accessible tends to be tends to take a little bit more time. Yeah, I bet, I bet as well. There's an awful lot of planning that goes involved in in something like that. Like 
how how much are you involved with that planning side of things? Uh, re- reasonable amount. We've got a guy called Gary Newman that works with Monster Carp, um, helps out with the fish off when we was doing that, and obviously helps out massively, or certainly does the vast majority of it for All Stars as well. Um, it's run past all of us, you know, so we all get a little bit of a say. Um, but really, it depends on what budget is there. It also depends on what time of year we're going. Um, depends on what species we target, and it also just, you know, there's there's lots of factors that go into um, what we do and how we do it. Um, yeah. And so if if we're pushing the boat out and it's taking up a if it's taking up a lump of the budget and a fair bit of time, then we've got to try and compromise somewhere else and go somewhere a bit more accessible, a little bit more of a banker to sort of you know balance the ship. Which um, out of all of them, which sort of uh, trips do you tend to look forward to the most? The ones that I would pay for out of my own pocket. <laughs> so we <laughs> went to Christ- Yeah, well, no, no, not not because of that, because I, I, you know, I'm buzzing to go there, you know? Right. Like, when I found out we was going to Croatia, albeit we didn't fish the venues that I would go to Croatia for, I knew mm-hmm. that it was the country that I wanted to experience. It was a country where I wanted to dip my toe in the water, and it and really, it ticked all the boxes, to be fair. We went to a smaller club lake and we targeted carp and, and grass carp. I think we called carp to 40 pounds, which ain't big for Croatia, let's face it. Um, and grass carp to just under 40 pounds, which was, yeah, it's a big fish, a big grassy anywhere in the world. Um, they do go a lot bigger, though, and I have got my eyes on a few venues where I could, <laughs> possibly will have a little bit of a trip sometime in the future. Um, but since then... It opened the door. I met a couple of people, and that led to one thing and another. And then last October, I went out and fished the Jarki, um, which is possibly one of the best carp lakes on the planet at the moment. And so, you know, it's it's nice to go to venues and, and countries where I want to visit in my own fishing. You know, a lot of yeah. these, a lot of these four, five, six week trips that I do um, for myself. You know, I just book them just like any other punter. I pay for them just like any other punter, and I go fishing. I go fishing for myself and. You know, when I took off to Croatia last October, me and a mate just literally jumped in a van, drove 19 hours through the night, got to a mm-hmm. lake in Croatia, and five days later, had well, I personally had 69 fish to 68 and a half pound. And it was all because mm-hmm. I'd experienced what I had experienced the year before when I was out there filming. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and one place that I've been to a couple of times filming um, is Italy. And because of that, you know, that's when I started to think, right, okay, well, every like over the last 10 years, Parco has slowly come onto the scene. Now, I know in the last four or five years, Parco has been, you know, blasted all over the place. It's so accessible. Mm. But when I first went out there, maybe, I can't remember when I first went out there, it seemed a long way to go. You know, driving a 1,000 miles from Calais, when people moan about four hours from Calais, seems an awful lot, you know, it seems a, a big old journey, but... Because I'd been out there and, and we'd all um, we'd filmed in Italy, I was desperate to go back out there and just experience a little bit more. And because you'd been there, you know, it makes the journey when you're doing it off your own back, just literally jumping in the van and just doing the drive, um, so much easier because you know what to sort of expect when you get there. Yeah. Driving, driving 20 hours through the night to go somewhere you're not entirely sure is going to live up to expectations is that's a leap of faith but if you've already been there and you've sort of experienced it and you know that there's something there waiting for you at the end of the trip then i haven't got a problem with some of these monster road trips they are hard everyone goes oh yeah but it's only mate let me tell you i've done i've done a few 19 20 hour solid journeys and it's always great to look back and it's always great to look forward to but when you're in the middle of it and you're 10 hours in with and you've literally only just (laughs) <laughs> broke the straw off the camel's body. You've only just literally got over the hump and you think another nine hours to go and you're just sitting there looking at the speedometer and you're thinking 70 mile an hour just ain't enough. <laughs> I need a play. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, what I've been asking, uh, so all the guests um, that have been coming on the, the sort of lockdown edition, like the one a day, I've been asking like a rotary style letter Um I should have briefed you beforehand, but I didn't. We sort of went straight into it. So what I might do, I'll ask it, and I'll, I'll bring, I'll go to another point just to give you an idea. Right. Um, Rich Wilby uh, asked this question. It's for you to answer, and it's, it's quite a simple one actually. It's just the biggest mistake in your own angling. Have you got any examples of that, or anything you can think of? Ooh, probably publicising too many venues that I was fishing. <laughs> right. I know it's going to sound stupid and selfish. 
but it isn't about me. And so when I was writing for the Times and when I was doing other, you know, quite a lot of writing, I used to publicise because I felt it was important that people knew where you was going and stuff. But the problem is I ruined it for other people and I learned my lesson. Um, and so one of the things that I don't do now is I try not to ruin the – well, I don't. I just don't ruin – you know, there's, there's certain little pockets of fishing all over the country, right? And we all want mm. to experience it, but it's, you know, it is what it is. There isn't enough room for all of us. And, um, and yeah, I've – I found some of those little pockets in the past and um, I screwed up basically. I wrote about them and I shouldn't have done and I learned the lesson. Um, and right. it didn't not, not only ruin my own fishing, but, you know, I, I took a bit of flack for it for a few people that I, I very much respected. And I fell out with one of them about it as well. Um, and and that was the, that's probably my only mistake slash regret. Hell, I've looked, I've screwed up opportunities. I've had, I mean, I've only caught one eight-pound chub, and it's the greatest fish in my life. But I've had two or three feeding that I've, I've still not managed to convert. Um, <laughs> but those are just stories, you know. On a serious note, the one thing I did, re- I do regret, was ruining a couple of people's fishing. Uh, oh, but a long time ago, this was now. A long yeah, time no, ago. And I know what you mean. Um, where I am is where it, there's um, sort of, it's all very hush hush. It, it has been for ages. Um, yeah, yeah. For, for, the, for that exact reason. Yeah, it, and it's a horrible thing to say, isn't it? I'm not a secret person. I'll tell you what I'm using, mm. how I'm catching. But if there's certain venues that I know will just get over, and it's protection of the fish as well. Some of the time, do you know what yeah. I mean? Because, um, but but if I know there's certain venues that that you know I've been invited on, or I've come about by you know by hook or by crook, and someone blatantly outright asks, then I just I'll just be honest. I will say, mate, I, I'm just not in a privileged position to tell you where it is. You know. For, out of respect for the anglers that live on the doorstep and fish it regularly. Yeah, no, good answer, good answer, mate. And um, if you can think of a question to ask the next guest, again, it can be anything. It doesn't have to be fishing related. Mine's going to be um, so much more shallow than that. Though. That's quite a deep question. Well, it? It's a deep, it's a good answer. That really, I no, think. It's well, not, it brought out the, it brought out the depth in me. Not much of it, though. <laughs> <laughs> to be wrong, about as deep as a puddle most of the time. <laughs> Uh, yeah, let's come back to it. I'll think about that. I'll think yeah, about no that. worries. Um, so one question I was going to ask, obviously, with this virus as it is, how do you think it's going to pan out? I mean, for you personally, and obviously your filming, your trips, that's going to cause a, a massive um, yeah. headache, I'd imagine, sort of reshuffling. How, how are you going to come about sort of now? Yeah, um, well, look, lockdown came on the day I was supposed to be travelling to France, so that wasn't right. ideal. So I, I missed out on my first trip, possibly my only trip to um, Lake the Premier this year. Um, it's normally a really good social trip as well because I get along really well with the manager out there. And, um, yeah, I was a bit gutted about that. And I'm a bit gutted about possibly missing my favourite part of the year, and I'm a bit gutted about this lasting that long. I miss my tench season as well because, like I alluded mm. to, it's probably only a month, six weeks long. But, you know... I've spoke about this to lots and lots of people on social media over the last couple of weeks. And, you know, as much as, as much as I'm desperate, mate, I am desperate to go and wet a line. I'm desperate to just go and run through the woods and just scream and just do whatever. All right. Just be out and be normal and just be able to walk around and shake hands and pat people on the back. I, I do see that being a long way down the line though, to be fair. I think this will definitely adjust the way people think about interacting. Um, mm. But, but, yeah, there are bigger things in play right now. And and every yeah. time I think about fishing, I also feel a bit selfish, the fact that there's a lot of families, not only just in Britain, but in Italy and in Spain and, and, and all over the world are really struggling. So is fishing a big deal right now when the when the exactly. when the world is has got a global pandemic? I don't think so. You know, it's a passion that we should all share and we shouldn't forget and we should we should talk about it because it makes us feel good and, and excited. But but I'm not in any rush to get my rods out until it's safe to do so. Yeah. God, blimey, yeah, I'm, yeah. Getting, I'm getting all sensible as well. What's happening <laughs> to me? <laughs> but so it's just, it's just uh, the speed is spreading um, as well. It's. I don't. You, do you know what? I go through phases. I go through phases where sometimes I think I'll be overreacting, and then I think, bloody hell, this is really, really bad and serious. And then you see the pictures of some really healthy, strong-looking guys, and I know one or two guys that have gone down with it, and they're they're fit and they're healthy, tough guys, and they were broken by it, you know. And and there's still yeah. people, mate. I went for a walk with a wife yesterday um, in the evening for our little sort of 
hour exercise sort of thing. And and there was there was four guys on mountain bikes all together. There was people with jet bikes out and all communi- like all in a bundle together. And I, like I, I'm not being funny. That you know I go through r- weird emotions in this. And I think everyone's yeah. the same. But my overriding yeah. emotion when I saw people like that is, is just out and out anger. Like mm. you know this is a government issued guideline. You know yeah. if if it was nothing, then we would all be going about our own business. Um, and so, yeah, I do go through phases where I think this is really bad. Like when you see them, that footage of all them people laying in the hallways in Italy, they can't mm. breathe, you know, and they're pulling respir- respiratory equipment off of old people and just sedating them and letting them go on their own in just a room full of sort of people. Their families can't be with them in their last breaths. I, I just think I don't want to know. I don't want anyone that I know. I don't want any of my friends. And I don't want any of my family to ever be in that position. That is horrible. Um, no. And those scenes that you see up at the XL Centre in London, 4,000 beds sitting there waiting for people that quite possibly ain't going to walk out of that place is, yeah, that's terrifying, mate. Yeah, no, absolutely. I completely agree with what you're saying. There. I mean, I'm personally in a bit of a, a, a weird situation. My mum... Um, it's been in the hospital. She she had a fall. She had like a few hip replacements right. uh, recently. We lost my dad in June last year, so she's been on her own since right. pretty much since a biggish house, you know. So just trying to readjust and cope. Yeah, she had a fall. I think it must have been date wise. It was the beginning of March. It was when England beat Ireland in the Six Nations. Right. Whatever that was. Yeah, that day she had a fall. Then she had to go to hospital, and she's just come out now. We're on the second of April, so she's come out this morning. Um, I only found out about a week ago, probably less than a week ago, that there's eight people on her ward. She was the only one at the time of testing that didn't have the no. virus. So out of eight of them, and apparently even like the ward, the ward manager went home with the temperature. It's it's just wrong. I think there's, I think I don't know. There's a lot that we, I think we don't know. But obviously, so oh, from wow. a, my perspective, I'm in a bit of a quandary because obviously, so she's now at home. She's got carers four times a day. Um, I don't because she hasn't really been seeing the news, even though she's been in hospital with it and she's getting off the odd update. She's asked me, she, she called me funnily enough, just when I video called you um, earlier. Yeah. Before we started recording, saying, Dom, um, can you just pop round, love? I need to help sorting out my pills. I'm like, I can't really come round. Mum, I, I can't. Just... Yeah, in case. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a tough one. I mean, we're doing the shopping for my one, parents. Yeah, my parents are, my because pa- my parents are 69, both of them. They're 70 mm-hmm. next year. Because they're 69, yeah. they're invincible. You know, oh, we're not yeah. seventy. I'm like, mum, dad, come on, let's be honest. If if you're twelve months out, you're still very close to the danger zone. So we've been doing the shopping for them. We've been picking up prescriptions for other people as well that should certainly shouldn't be going out. And and without sound, sounding like a saint, I've been trying to enforce people that that have got a greater chance of getting it bad. Um, been yeah. trying to enforce how serious this is so that they don't go out. Um, yeah. And then going round the back and leaving their shopping on the on on the table in the garden and then walk into the gate and then they come out to collect it and then you've got like i don't know we have a couple of minutes of a chat and stuff but and then yeah. and then you're going you know and and we've got we've got birthdays obviously that have just happened and that are just about to happen and mm. and you know just going around literally just dropping a card on the table in the back garden and then just leaving and just waving through the window it's like you know where does it end and uh, wait when you go shopping yeah. as well don't let you but when you go shopping I've noticed a lot of people still picking things up and putting it down and just looking at sell by yeah, dates. Yeah. And I just, when I come out of the shops, I can't work out how with all of these people like picking up and putting down, how we ain't all going to get it at some point anyway, you yeah. know, and yeah. all these idiots yeah. with gloves on that are still scratching their face because they got gloves on, they're immune. I'm like, come on people. <laughs> you know, I did a little Facebook lot and not a Facebook live. I'm getting mixed up for all me, all me bits and bobs. As you know, I'm still stuck in the 20th century, but I did a little story the other day. And I almost shouted down the phone because I watched this person with a mask on walk into the doctor's and he grabbed hold of the mask from the inside out with his gloves on and put it on his face. And I was like, what the f... (laughs) Where are people's brains, you know? But then how far do you take it? Like, you know, you come out of the shops, you take your gloves off, and, and and then you, you, you get all your antiseptic stuff and you rub it all over your hands, but then you've, you've had, you've had the gloves on when you've touched your shopping bags and then you don't want to touch your shopping bags. And mate, it's, yeah. it, if you let it play with your head, I think it will just do you in, you know, you just yeah, do what you got to do. 
try and get on with your life and deal with it as well as possible. I, I guess my biggest tip now would be what I'm trying to enforce on myself is don't watch too much of the news because it would just bring yeah. you down. I think in the last couple yeah. of days, if I'm absolutely honest, I'm quite an upbeat person. Me and the missus have been great. I've been on social media so much, and, and it's really helped me because it's just killed hours of my day. Um, mm. Just answering questions, FaceTiming people, just you name it, whatever, right? We're all we're all open. We're all in the same situation. Let's just deal with it, all right? It's not gonna not gonna be like that forever, but let's just do what we got to do to get through it. But but a couple of days on the bounce, I watch the news, and maybe it was just Piers Morgan done it to me. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but because watching him in the morning sometimes is great, and other oh, times he's just like, mate, I just want to go and look at door handle. Um, but but you know, I, I got pretty. Not depressed. That's the wrong word. That's 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 totally the wrong word. But I got pretty like anxious about it. Yeah. You know, it was just all negative and all like, you know, like at the moment I'm staying indoors. I'm safe as ours is. And if everyone does what we saw today when we went shopping and stays, you know, two meters doesn't seem an awful lot now, mate. Because I'll tell you, when I go out, most people are staying a long way away from me. Um, I've, I've make myself look like I've got more than just the coronavirus, just so people don't want to come near me. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it'll be okay. I just think it's so surreal. It's completely alien to what the human race has ever done. Yeah, you know, we're a social, we are a social race, aren't we? Even though there's a lot of people I probably don't get on with and probably don't like me. But hey ho, you know, it's we're all just in it to survive right now, aren't we? Yeah, no, absolutely. I um. It sort of is, and I think, like you say, people almost feel like they're invincible until it happens. Even like someone really close to them, isn't it? It's that sort of weird mentality that a lot of people tend to have. Yeah, I think it's too late, though, isn't it? And I said this to someone else the other day as well. You know, I think like it's easy to stay away from strangers because it, because you think all strangers could have it, but your neighbours yeah. or your friends or your family that you think, well, that's all right, I've known them for 10 years, they'd tell me, you can't, yeah. you don't know who's got this, mate. And I think... Yeah, and but, even they don't know at the time with the, the incubation period of it as well. Yeah, exactly. And I think the danger is catching it off of someone that you've been close to for a long time. You know, not, obviously not on purpose, but, but, but because yeah. the likelihood is that when you just have a chat on your front drive with a neighbour, you know, staying three, four metres away from them feels weird. So by the time you by the time you thought about it, like I was out cleaning. This is probably a week ago now, in fairness. So, but I was out cleaning the van yeah. about a week ago. I was having a chat with my neighbour who was on the other side of the van, and I dropped down to do the wheels with the old toothbrush. And before I knew it, it was on me hip, and I stood up and I went <laughs> right back off, dude, back the <laughs> off. <laughs> you know, and it, because when you talk, you just gravitate towards getting closer, don't yeah. you? It's it's yeah. a normal thing. But I think we're far enough down the line. There are there's probably less than 10% of the population that are being idiots. Most people have got on board. I think we're all pretty sensible. We all want to want to beat this, um, this little invisible killer that's trying to take us all down. But um, mm. But sometimes you just have to have a bit of a reality check and just, you know, stand back as, as weird as it feels. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, awesome. Well, we're at the hour mark now already, Dean. So, if you have you got a question for the Rotary Lab? I mean, if not, oh, I totally you can forgot. text it to me. Um, All right. Awesome. The one thing, like money aside, time aside, what would be the one thing in fishing they would want to do? Okay. Nice. You know. I'll, um, right, yeah, that'll go with the rotary letter to the next one. And there's one other thing, just to keep the mood light. Um, I've been asking everyone to do a, a sketch of a carp. It's got to be done within 60 seconds. <laughs> and I need you to film it or get the missus to film it. And it can be no longer than 60 seconds. So stop, bang on a minute. And I'm going to do like a little fun competition and try and get some prizes donated for I, the winner. I might have to get on the Stan Arts Instagram page and have a little look oh, at yeah. some of these. <laughs> <You're> tracing. <laughs> Good morning, they end up looking like a bloody frog or something. <laughs> okay, there's a, don't worry, the bar's um, reasonably low. Is it? Some right. of the entries are ready, so right. well, let, let, to worry about. let me check my diary and I'll try and fit you in. <laughs> awesome. All right. right, Dean, thank you very much, mate. My pleasure, mate. Anytime.